If you got your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 17 is where we're going to start this morning. This has nothing to do with the message, but about the song that we just sang. When you look at the attributes of God, the, the characteristics of who God, who God is that makes God God, God's goodness uh, has, over the last year or so, or really few years, has become uh, arguably one of my favorite attributes of God. Because not only is God powerful and strong and sovereign, but He's good in all of that. And so He cares for us and He loves us and He wants um, what is best for us, which is ultimately Him. All right, so this week as I wrote out my sermon, um, I realized that it's way too long. We were covering way too much stuff. So I had to kind of chop it in half. So what I had sent to Jonah early in the week uh, had a few more verses, but we're just going to look at verses 17 through 19 this morning. And as we look at this for for this week, uh, next week, and really the week after that, we're going to look at the idea of, of change. We're going to look at the idea of how as Christians there is a change that comes into our life when we place our faith and trust in Jesus. So if you remember, we have said so far, kind of taking a big picture look at the book of Ephesians. The first half, which happens to be just the first three chapters of Ephesians, it's all about the gospel. It's all about what Christ has done for us. It's all about the change that comes into our life, kind of from a more theological perspective of who Jesus is and who we were before Christ and what happens to us in Christ, in salvation. And we've said the second half is much more practical. Because of Jesus, because we have trusted in him, what does that mean for us day to day? What does that mean for us Monday through Sunday? How does that impact my my actual life, uh, 9 to 5, 24-7, 365, down here on earth? And there is a foundational truth for us that we find in Scripture, and it is this, that faith brings change. Faith brings change. Faith, when we trust in Christ, brings a change in our life. And this, we see this throughout Scripture, and probably one of the ways we see it most boldly or just kind of black and white is in the book of James. In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, it says this, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So faith also by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So as James talks about faith and works, James is not saying that we are saved by our works, or we are saved by the things that we do. But the whole point of James' teaching in the second half of chapter 2 is all about When we are saved, when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that brings a change into our life. It changes who we are. And so we see that both theologically and uh, practically. So we saw in the first half that we go from being uh, dead to being alive in Christ. That we go from being uh, sons of disobedience, uh, children of wrath, to being adopted into God's family, the, the sons of God, when we talk about that inheritance that we have in Christ. Also, James talks about this in a much more practical way. That when we place our faith and trust in Christ, it changes everything of who we are changes how we think, changes how we parent, it changes how we interact with others, it changes what we think about, it changes how we live. Our faith does not just change our standing with God, which it does, which is incredible, but it also changes who we are day in and day out while we live our life. So, next week we're going to look at kind of what we are changed to. This morning, we're going to look at what we are changed from. Because as Paul talks about this in the book of Ephesians, he lays out for us, this is who you used to be. Don't be this anymore. Be this. And so before we get to who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to live, we need to stop and look at basically what we're not supposed to be or who we're not supposed to be. So if you are able, I'm going to ask that you stand in the honor of reading God's Word We're going to read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. Then we will pray. Then you may be seated. Paul writes, 
Now this I say and testify on the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you now. We thank you for this time that you have given us, God, this opportunity to come and to study your word. Father God, I pray that as we look at your truth, Father God, that you would speak uh, through the Holy Spirit, that you would speak through your word, God, just to our hearts, to the core, to the depths of who we are. And Father God, I pray that we might encounter you this morning. So God, if that is encouragement, if that is conviction, whatever it is, wherever it is that we are at, whatever we need, Meet us with your truth. Meet us with yourself. And Father God, draw us closer to you. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. So the first thing that I want us to see in verse 17 is that the change faith brings makes us different from unbelievers. Paul writes in verse 17, Now this I say and testify on the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So Paul starts with this kind of command to say, this is who you are. You're supposed to be different. Don't live this way anymore. There should be a difference in your life. Specifically, don't walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their mind. And so there's a lot here in this verse to unpack. This is uh, a big verse with a lot of truth in it because Paul is kind of laying a line in the sand where he's saying, look, if you are a Christian... There's an expectation on how you live your life. There's an expectation on who you are. This side of the land, or side of the uh, side of the of the line in the sand, it's the Gentile. This side is the believer. Basically, what Paul is saying is, if you are a Christian, here's how the Gentiles live. Don't do that. You do this. You live in a way that glorifies and honors Christ, which we will look at next week. So we see this when he says, he starts off, he says, no longer walk. He says, you must no longer walk. We know that when Paul uses this word walk in this term, in this context, he is referring to not physically walking. He's referring to how we live our life. He's referring to the habits, the patterns of who we are. He's talking about how we think, how we live, the things that we do, the words that we say. He's talking about just just who you are. And so Paul says that there should be a difference in who we are or how we live. Now let me just say this. As we talk about this difference, as we start talking about these acts over the next couple weeks of of who we're to be and how we are to be different, understand Paul addresses all of this after he's already explained the gospel. After he's already uh, proclaimed who Christ is and what Christ has done. The assumption here is gospel first, then the change. Because when we get that mixed up and we try to change our lives apart from the gospel or apart from salvation, that's self-righteousness. That breeds arrogance. And that really, it's, it's, it's an errand. It's a, it's a job that cannot be done, that cannot be accomplished. So we have to remember as we talk about change, this is not saying, hey, just go out and try to be a good person. This is saying because of what God has done, because God has sent his son who died for us, who gave his life, who uh, rose from the grave, who ascended into heaven, who is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God, because of everything that God has done for us, because we have placed our faith and trust in him, then comes the change. I just want to make sure that we are all clear on that. So Paul says that we are no longer to walk, or we're to live differently, and he says, from the Gentiles. That we are no longer walk as the Gentiles do. So what is Paul referring to here? So in the Old Testament, the word Gentile refers to anyone who's not a Jew. But it's more than just an ethnic or a racial thing. It's more than just, hey, here are the Jewish people, and everyone who has a different skin tone, or everyone who lives in a different region, they're the Gentiles. That played a part into it, but the main idea of it is not so much ethnic or racial. It's about the covenant. If you remember the Israelites, starting with Abraham, they were the covenant people of God. God called Abraham. God said, I'm going to make a promise with you. Uh, I will bring you to a land that I will show you. I will make your your lineage, your children, your descendants greater than the the stars in the sky. Um, I'm going to take you and make you into a great nation. 
And the covenant people of Israel, or the covenant people of God, was Israel. Those were the ones that God spoke to. Those were the ones that God worked through. Those were the ones that were proclaimed to proclaim to the other nations that, that their God was the one true God. So for us, as you go through the history of the Bible, the covenant people moved from being Israel to being the church, the, the new covenant. We are God's chosen covenant people. And so the idea that Paul is talking here, when he's talking about the Gentiles, he's not talking about non-Jews. He's not talking about an ethnic group. He's talking about a spiritual group. The Gentiles here is basically anyone who has not placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We typically use the term lost. Those who are unsaved. Those who have never trusted Jesus for their salvation. And so when Paul says, do not walk as the Gentiles do, he is saying that as a Christian, there should be a difference in your life of who you were before Christ, because before Christ, we all fit into that Gentile category, and also from the rest of the world. If you are a Christian, then you have been set apart. We'll look at the idea of holiness next week, but we have been set apart to live, to act differently than the, the people around us who don't know Christ. So Paul says there should be a change, there should be a difference in how you live from who you used to be and from those around you who don't know Christ. There should be a, a marked difference between the believer and the one who is lost. So why are we to walk, why are we to walk different than the Gentiles? Why can't we not just say, well, I've been promised heaven, so why can't I just kind of live how I want to live and do what I want to do? We understand theologically all that God has done for us. Why does that have to play out in our life in a practical way at all? Then the reality is, when God saves us, He does change us. But the reality is that, that lostness and the sin associated with that never moves us to Christ. And really that's what the rest of this passage that we're looking at this morning is about. In fact, spe specifically... Uh, Paul says, uh, do not walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So what does that mean, the futility of their minds? Basically, this is a mindset that is not submitted to God. This is a mind, this is a purpose, this is a, a, the pursuit of life that is not surrendered to and submitted to God, to his righteousness, to his holiness, to his authority, to his uh, goodness, to his love. It is not one that is submitted to God in faith and salvation. And so because of that, it is a mind or it is a lifestyle that seeks joy, that seeks purpose, that seeks fulfillment, that seeks its own form of righteousness wherever it can find it. It is, it is futile in the fact that it doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't bring about anything. Trusting in God brings about life. It does. It brings about hope. No matter what our situation, we serve a God who is good, who does love us, who is faithful. And so trusting Him and following Him, it has purpose. And it ends, or brings an end result of salvation and eternity. Pursuing anything else is futile in the fact that it offers nothing eternal. It does not offer life. Even the best things that this world can offer, even good things that this world can offer, are futile compared to the things of God because it does not offer life. And as Paul talks about this futility of mind, it's more than just, it leads to things more than just, hey, kind of wandering around. It typically always leads us farther away from God. Listen to how uh, Romans chapter 1 says this. In verses 21 through 23, it says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking. Same phrasing that Paul uses in Ephesians. And their foolish hearts were darkened. We'll see that phrase in a second too. Verse 22, it says, Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling man and birds and animals and creeping things. Basically what Paul says is this futility of mind leads to the rejection of God and an idolatry or an exaltation of creation. 
Now, maybe one of the places our mind kind of first goes to when we see that is we think of, well, there might be tribes in Africa or, or South America that, that worship animals or that worship the, the totems and that worship uh, ancestors, but, but we don't see that now. I think that we do. We live in a world, we live in a culture that ex exalted humanity far above God. There are even Christians and churches who have exalted loving uh, humanity or loving your neighbor or loving each other even above loving God. When we see abortion advocates say that God loves abortion, that is exalting the creation over the creator. When we see the, the sexual revolution from the 60s on, even into today, that exalts the creation of the creator. Live without uh, uh, boundaries. Live with a, just kind of throw everything off and do whatever you want to do. Whatever makes you happy, whatever uh, brings you fulfillment, you just go ahead and do. Throw all restraint off. When we see our culture trying to redefine gender, uh, to make uh, uh, people feel happy or to feel whatever that may be, all of this is the exaltation of creation over creator, which comes from this futility of mind, which comes from them not being surrendered to God. When we surrender to God, we understand that God has set a standard where God has said, this is what is good, this is what is right, this is what is holy, this is what is just. And so we strive to line up underneath that. When people do not surrender to God, then they see all of God's standards, rules, whatever you want to call them. And naturally, we want to rebel against that. We don't want anyone telling us what is good or what we should do or telling us that we are wrong. So instead, we try to create our own rules. We try to create our own righteousness. And that is what Paul is describing in Ephesians and Romans. This futility of mind is trying to create your own form of righteousness, your own form of goodness, your own form of morality. And it is futile because it brings you nothing eternal. Ultimately, all it will bring you is judgment so as we move forward in verse 18 Paul kind of shows where this futility of mind comes from now a lot of times with Paul's writing he kind of starts with the, the end result and kind of builds to the foundation my mind works backwards I'd rather start with the foundation so we're gonna look at verse 18 starting from the end moving back to the beginning. But we'll read verse 18, then we'll kind of jump back to the, the end of 18 and just kind of work our way backward through the verse. But verse 18 says, They are darkened in their futility, or darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. So if we're going to start at the end, we're going to see that the foundation of lostness is an unregenerate heart. Paul says, due to the hardness of their heart. So one of the, the images that, that Scripture uses, Old Testament and New Testament, of the heart that is not surrendered to God or subjected to God is it is a, is a hard heart. They dealt a lot with agricultural societies during this time. So the idea of a hard heart or hard ground was ground that was uh, too tough to, to plant in. It was too hard to, to do anything with. That before you could plant it, it had to be toiled. It had to be worked. It had to be made to where you could plant something in it to, to bring about crops, to bring about fruit. So the idea of the, the hardness of heart is an unregenerate heart. It's a heart that is not surrendered to God. It is a heart that is not subjected to Him. In Ezekiel chapter 36, it's a, it's a prophetic passage looking forward to the new covenant, which is Jesus Christ and what He has done for us. It says this, And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I, will put in my, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So Paul is saying, or uh, Ezekiel is saying, and Paul uh, kind of carrying the same idea, is before Christ, our heart is a heart of stone. Before Christ, our heart is hard. It is hard towards God. It is hard towards who He is, towards His love, towards His goodness, towards His standards. But when God brings about salvation, God takes that heart of stone and He exchanges it for what He says, a heart of flesh, a heart that can work, a heart that pumps blood, a heart that, that has life in it. 
Obviously, he's being figurative here. We don't get a physical heart at the time of salvation. But the idea here is having a heart that cannot work, that does not produce life, till we are made new creatures in Christ. We're giving a new heart. And so as Christians, when we look at this line in the sand, when we look at this difference between us and Gentiles, or us and the lost, us and those who have not placed their faith and trust in Christ, the foundational difference is... We have a heart that has been made new by the blood of Christ. And their hearts are still hearts of stone until they hear the gospel and they respond in faith to Christ. Let me just say this and understand this. When we talk about this difference between us and uh, uh, those who don't yet know Jesus, that does not elevate us and mean that we are superior to them. That does not make us better than them. It just means that we have trusted in Christ. The only difference between a believer and an unbeliever is Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. We are not superior, we are not greater, we've just recognized the greatness and the grace of Jesus Christ. So as Paul continues, uh, we see that an unregenerate heart leads to moral ignorance. So he says, uh, let me find the end of verse 18, uh, because, due to the hardness of their heart and if we back up it says because of the ignorance that is in them so the ignorance here that Paul is talking about is not uh, a lack of book smarts or a lack of street smarts there are a lot of people who are infinitely smarter than I am or, or uh, can, can survive and do things that I could never do or accomplish so the idea here is not uh, uh, the ability to think or the ability to, to read or to know or to learn when he's talking about ignorance here, it is, it, it's a moral ignorance. It's, a, it's an ignorance that rejects God, that rejects who he is. In fact, if you read through the book of Proverbs and you see so much, I'm talking about foolishness and wisdom, the idea of that is almost never uh, mental acuity or mental ability. It's all about, wisdom is about surrendering to and trusting and loving and following God. Foolishness is a rejection of God. This is just a continuation of that idea in the New Testament. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul writes, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The ignorance that Paul is talking about is an ignorance that rejects God, that the cross is folly. The cross is foolishness. Well, why would you pray to some imaginary guy in the sky? Why would you trust that some guy that died 2,000 years ago can save you? This makes no sense to the heart that is perishing, to the one that rejects God, to the one who has not yet placed their faith and trust in Christ. For us, the gospel, for us, the cross, it is life. We understand its greatness. We understand its impact. We understand we are insanely and incredibly thankful for it. But for the one whose heart is hard, they are blind to the reality of Jesus. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He uses this illustration of a veil to kind of present the same idea. He says, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses who would put a veil over his face. That's talking about when, veil, when Moses came off the mountain, he would veil his face because it shone the glory of God. So that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. What Paul says there is that for the, the Jewish people, when they would read the Old Covenant, that's the, the, the Law and the Prophets, that's the Old Testament, which is chock full of pointing to Jesus. Paul even says in Galatians that the Law is our schoolmaster who points us to salvation in Christ. But their hearts were veiled. They had a veil covering it, so they could not see Christ in the Old Testament. They could not see the true message that God was presenting. And so he says that veil is only removed by Christ. In the same way, a hard heart is only softened by the gospel of Jesus Christ. A hard heart is only changed and made a heart of flesh through the gospel of Jesus Christ. From us hearing that God is love and that God is holy and that we are sinners and our sin separates us from God and it places us under the judgment and the justice of God. And we all deserve punishment because of our sin. But because God is love, He chose to love us even though we were 
were his enemies. And he loved us enough that he sent his own son, as Jonah was saying, the king of kings steps out of heaven and places on human flesh. And he suffers for us and he dies in our place. And he is buried in the ground for three days until he rises again to conquer sin, to conquer death. And now he sits at the right hand of the throne of God, constantly making intercession on our behalf. When we place our faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ, then that heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh. And it is now pumping life. It is now pumping blood throughout our who we are spiritually and also as we live our lives. And that only happens through Christ. All right, so next, we see that moral ignorance alienates one from God. So if we start back at the end of 18, due to the hardness of their heart, because of the ignorance that is in them, uh, they are alienated from the life of God. Ultimately, ultimately, this is the big problem of the hard heart and the moral ignorance, is that its end result is it separates us from God. It alienates humanity from their Creator. The one who made them, the one who made us, who formed us in our mother's wombs, the one who who created the world in six days, the one who created Adam and Eve and gave them rule over creation, the one who made us to know him and to love him because of our sin, because of our hardness of heart, we have rejected him. And what that does is that puts a separation between us and God. And that's why we need the gospel. Because we are alienated from God. We are separated from God. What that means in a very real sense is that for the lost person, until God intercedes in their life through the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's no desire for God. There's no love for God. There's no yearning for God. There's no hunger for Him. There's no real genuine concern about who He is or what He has done for us or uh, His standards of righteousness and justice. None of it. There is separation. There is alienation. There is ignorance towards there. And it puts that chasm between man and God. That's the problem with being lost. Because when there is that separation with us and God, that means that there is going to come a time when that separation turns to judgment. Because that separation comes because of our moral ignorance, because we have rejected God. The reason why we need to take the gospel out, the reason why people desperately need to hear about Jesus Christ is because they are separated from God. Before Christ, we were separated from God. I went to church, uh, uh, my parents had me in church from basically day one uh, until, well, well now I'm still in church. Um, but it wasn't until I was 14 years old that I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So those first 14 years, I was a good kid. I could quote Bible verses, I could tell you about scripture, but guess what? I was alienated from God. No matter my good works, no matter what I did, no matter my my biblical knowledge, because I had not yet surrendered my life to the authority and the salvation of Jesus Christ, I was separated from God. The only thing that can bind up what is separated, the only thing that can restore what is broken, is Jesus Christ. And as we look at this idea of this line in the sand and there being a Why are we striving not to live like the Gentile? Why is there that difference? It's because for the Gentile, they don't know God. For the Gentile, there is no relationship with God. For the Gentile, they are alien to God. They don't care. They don't know. They don't love. They don't want. For us, if we have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it should be exactly the opposite. We are now the sons and daughters of God. We have been adopted into His family. We're not separated. We are part of the same family, tied together, bound together by Jesus Christ. We are to love and to worship and be thankful for Him because of His goodness and His faithfulness towards us. Yet if we are striving to live like the Gentile, if we are striving to live how we live before our salvation, or we are striving to fit in with the culture around us, what we are declaring is 
that we are more comfortable being bound to sin and bound to the world and alienated from God than we are being bound to God and alienated from the world. Because there's not, there's not a gray area here. It's one or the other. That's why James says friendship with the world is hostility towards God. That doesn't mean that we can't have friends who are lost. We need to have friends with, with people who don't know Christ. But it means when you look at the world, when you look at its systems, when you look at its ideologies that are anti-God, there should be a difference in who we are. We cannot cling to the world and cling to God. You'll cling to God and be separated from the world, or you'll be separated from God and you'll be clinging to the world. Finally, we see that lostness shows itself uh, in moral confusion and a hunger for more sin. So we're going to look at the very top of uh, 19 and the, or of 18, then we'll look at verse 19, kind of group those together. It says, "They are darkened in their understanding." And in verse 19 it says, "They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity." The idea of being darkened in their understanding is the same thing as, as the futility of their mind. There is a, it's like wandering around in a, in a dark cave. I think it was last summer we went uh, on vacation uh, and we went to some underground uh, springs in a cave. I can't remember where it was at. Somewhere in Tennessee, I think. There's this one point where they turn off the lights and it is so dark that you literally cannot... Uh, someone could be right in front of your face. You would have no idea that they were there. That's the idea here. It's this lostness, this separation from God, this hardness of heart. It leads to this darkness of understanding. And the light is Jesus. But this darkness of understanding, he goes on to say in verse 19 where he describes it, kind of practically how it plays out. He says that they have become callous. That's that hardness of heart again. There's, there, there's, no, there's no softness towards God or the things of God. They have given themselves up to sensuality. Sensuality is throwing off restraint. Sensuality is throwing off uh, any, any borders, any kind of guidelines. Sensuality is doing whatever you want to. Doing what feels good. Doing what you think will make you happy. Even though sin only brings destruction. Then it says greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Oftentimes when we think of greed, we think of money. But here Paul uses the same term. And he says that we are greedy for more sin. Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Greedy to run towards sin. Greedy to embrace sin. Greedy to accept sin. Greedy to say that sin is okay or that sin is even good. This is a lostness. And if you don't believe it, look at our world around us and, and you see this on display 24-7. So what do we walk away with this? One, we need to remember that there was a time when we were lost. And so when we look at those who were lost, we need to understand where they're at. And we need to understand that Jesus Christ is the only one that can take them from being lost to being found. From being dead to being made alive. From being a child of disobedience and a child of wrath to being a child of God. It is why it is so imperative for us to proclaim the gospel. It's why it is so important for us to proclaim Jesus Christ, His life, His death, His resurrection. It's why it's so important for us to invite people to church so they can hear the gospel. It's why we cannot be content to kind of sit in a little holy huddle, but we have to go out into the world to proclaim Christ because without that, people die in their sins with a hardness of heart, moral ignorance towards God, living in darkness. The only place that ends is destruction and judgment and hell. The only escape for that is Jesus Christ. And the ones who have been called to be the ambassadors, to be the bearers of the good news, you and me. We are the ones who tell people about Christ. So if we want to see people go from lost to found, we have to proclaim the gospel. Now, Paul's focus here is not on the lost person. Paul's focus here in describing this is not to say, hey, let's go be evangelistic. We should be, so we take that as a reminder. But Paul's focus here is on the church. Paul's focus here is on believers. Paul's focus here is on, on, on you and me, those of us who have placed our faith and trust in Christ. And he is saying there should be a change in your life. 
There should be a change in my life. Who we used to be should not be who we are. Who we are should not look like the world around us. That doesn't mean we have to wear Christian t-shirts all the time or have a a funny kind of haircut or wear a, a, a certain kind of clothes or wear suits all the time or have certain facial hair. It doesn't mean that. It means who we are, how we live, how we think, what our purpose is, where we find our joy. All of that is changed because of Jesus. And the command here is that we are to look and live different from the lost world around us. There should be a difference in how we respond and how we react and how we talk and what we think about and what we desire and what what we are passionate about. There should be a difference. So I think for Paul's original audience, I think even for us, the question now becomes us looking in our lives and saying, is there a difference? Is there a difference? When I look at the lost person described, am I more content with the world? Do I want to live like everyone else and look like everyone else? Do I still want to live like a Gentile and just have fire insurance on the side? Let me just tell you, theologically, that's not a thing. That's not, that's, that's not a thing. That's not true. You can't say, well, I got my fire insurance. I prayed a prayer and got dunked. Uh, and now I'm just going to go do what I want to do. James would say, your, your faith is dead. That faith is not saved because that's not genuine faith. Genuine faith brings about a change, not perfection. Understand, this change starts at the time of our salvation and it continues on until the time that we die and we step into the throne room of heaven and then we are made perfect. I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect. I'm not saying that you're going to be sinless. I'm not saying that you're never going to struggle. But when you look at the direction, when you look at the walk, When you look at the purpose of your life, is there a change? Is there a desire for God? Is there a hunger for God? Is there a thirst for righteousness? Or is there greed for all kinds of impurity? All kinds of sin? Where are you at? So here's how we're going to respond this morning. When Jonah comes up here and plays and we have our time of invitation... There's really only, only uh, two responses to this. One, you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You are the Gentile person that Paul describes. And you need Jesus. My encouragement, my challenge to you is that you would repent of your sins and you would place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You can do that at your seat. You can come and talk to me standing up front and we can walk you through that. I can hook you up with a pastor or a deacon or a Sunday school leader who can go and take you if you have any questions and they can just walk with you through the gospel. Don't let anything keep you from following and obeying and trusting in Jesus and the life that he's offering If you are a Christian in this room, here's our response. We look inside. We ask God to examine our hearts. And we say, God, is there a change in my life? Am I pursuing after you? Or have I become content? Have I become comfortable? Have I just kind of settled down and settled back to live kind of looking like everyone else or looking like I did before I trusted Christ? Where are you at in your walk with God? Paul starts off, he says, I command you or I challenge you. Let me read it exactly so I don't mess it up. I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Are we walking as the Gentiles do? Or are we walking in faith and repentance, trusting in the person and the blood of Jesus? Is it changing who we are? That's a question only you and God answer.